for the Feast of All Saints Day. There are a few announcements, a number of announcements I'd like to draw your attention to. Uh, tomorrow is All Souls Day, and you can gain the, what they call the Totius Quosis Indulgence. The Code of Canon Law uh, actually says one can start gaining indulgence at noon today. What the Totius Quotius indulgence is, uh, is this, and first let me just give a short explanation. Totius Quotius is Latin, it means as often as you shall do this on this day. So, so most plenary indulgences, whereas a complete, one can complete, gain a complete indulgence, can usually only be gained on once a day. The Totius Quotius, as often as you shall do this, you can gain that indulgence. So starting at noon today, through tomorrow, and then also next Sunday, one can gain the Totius Quotius indulgence. What the Totius Quotius indulgence is, is indulgence granted by the Church through the merits of our Lord Jesus Christ, the saints and Our Lady. Uh, we draw upon those merits, and of course for our Lord is of infinite value, that if we perform a certain work, our Lord, uh, the Church says that all the punishment due to that sin will be forgiven if someone be in purgatory. Let's say your Aunt Jenny or Uncle Bill is in purgatory and you fulfill all the requirements, you, do, you gain this plenary indulgence for Uncle Bill, uh, whatever the punishment may be that he has, he will be forgiven and he'll uh, send straight into heaven, go straight to heaven, be taken to heaven. So the church says we can do this uh, on All Souls Day. And there's other indulgences as well that you can gain throughout the year. I'll put some more of them in next Sunday. But to gain the indulgence, uh, I put at the back of the bulletin, there's a number of conditions that are required. First off, you must have the intention to do so. We can't come back and say, oh yeah, I did everything right, but I just didn't think about it yesterday. Well, it has to, you have the intention to gain the indulgence first off. And then you have to be in the state of sanctifying grace. It means you have to go to confession within the, either a week before or a week after, after at, by the completion of that uh, particular good work, the prayers, whatever it might be. So uh, obviously it's a good time to go to confession that you can gain this for your, uh, those with whom you pray, pray for. And who do we pray for? Uh, certainly there's those that we owe an obligation, a debt to. If our parents are not alive, then certainly to them. Uh, family, relatives, friends, benefactors, someone who may have assisted us that we maybe didn't know about, and maybe they're in, are in need of our prayers. And so we can have the intention to do it for one of them. Uh, and then we must fulfill the, the, the good work. What the Totius Quotius indulgence uh, envisions is that on All Souls Day, starting today, actually I'll start on All Saints Day today, All Souls Day next Sunday, that one would go to a church, enter the church and pray six Our Fathers, six Hail Marys, six Lord be the Fathers. Um, and then um, the prayers, anyway, so then also you have to say some prayer for the Pope's intentions, which the Pope hasn't, there's no Popes out here now, and the, and the attention, last known attention was under Pope Pius XII, and I put it in the bulletin, so go back to last Sunday's bulletin. And actually some of the intentions were is that if there's no specific intention that you know of, it comprised the exaltation of the Holy Mother of the Church, the propagation of faith, the uprooting of heresy, the conversion of sinners, peace and concord, uh, so that there's certainly can have that intention. And then um, the prayers must be vocal. In other words, it can't just be mental prayer. Mental prayer is just when I'm just thinking in my mind. It's like uh, having a, a thought. I'd like to go buy an ice cream cone. That's mental. If you verbalize that and say, I want to have an ice cream cone, you mention it out loud, now that's vocal. So it doesn't have to be, you don't have to yell it out. It doesn't have to be spoken out loud. Just at least wise, as if someone were lip reading, you have to, at least the lips have to be moving, pronouncing the words, I want an ice cream cone. In this case, of course, in this case with indulgence, it's not the ice cream, it's the Hail Marys and Our Fathers. And so what's required is the visit to the church and pray six Our Fathers, six Hail Marys, and I believe six Glory Be to the Fathers in order to gain the Tosias Quotias. Um, and now, and you just can't go to any church. You can't go to the Methodist Church, the Lutheran Church, the Mormon Church, uh, whatever. It has to be the Catholic Church. You can't go to apostate church. So. Uh, one may in, uh, envision once again that if you cannot go to the, the small town, you can't go to the churches, you have to at least wise leave and then turn around and come back. So you can't just 
uh, say six our Father, six Hail Mary, six Hail Mary, and just do it again. You have to actually step out of the church as if you were making another visit and come back in. And then you can do the same six our Father, six Hail Mary, six Hail Mary, And you don't have to go to confession for every time you, ma- you do this. Confession within the week be- from last Sunday till uh, next Sunday, one may gain th- that indulgence. And if you're going to gain it on next Sunday, you'd have it until the following Sunday to go to confession and receive Holy Communion. And certainly one cannot perform a greater work of mercy. They, we have what we call the spiritual works of mercy and the corporal works of mercy. Uh, spiritual works of mercy are spiritual works that we can perform. Corporal works are, for example, feeding the poor, visiting the sick, burying the dead, and so forth, uh, all meritorious themselves. Uh, What the church says, when we pray for the dead, we perform, they said, all the corporal works of mercy uh, for them. And uh, actually, next Sunday bulletin, I already have it done. I'm going to put a a little bit in there talking about All Souls Day, uh, what what they would like of us, what they are suffering. And what they suffer is basically, if I may say so, all what the saints have said. They suffer everything that those who are in purgatory. Remember, they're in purgatory. They're not in hell. In hell, they suffer, they'll suffer the pains of fire for all eternity without any remission, and they will hate one another unremittingly, and they will hate God with a passion forever. In purgatory, saints believe, theologians believe that those in purgatory suffer all the pains of hell as far as the fire, because the Lord said that one shall be purified as gold in the fire to burn off the dross. The dross is the punishment or even the sin itself, the venial sins itself. And someone who is in purgatory certainly wants our prayers. Those who are in hell don't want our prayers. Those in heaven don't need our prayers. Those in purgatory do need our prayers. And so we assist them by uh, not only gaining indulgences but praying uh, frequently for the repose of their soul. I said that all those who are in purgatory suffer all the torments, of, if you will, purgatory of the fire, purifying fires. The difference, one major difference, a couple major difference between purgatory and hell, the fires of purgatory and the fires of hell, is that they both burn the same. Purgatory, uh, fi- the fires of hell burns forever. However, in purgatory, they love. They love God and they love you. In hell, those who are suffering the, pur- the fires of hell will also suffer eternal hatred uh, and, and, unre- and, and remorse forever that they didn't do it, but they, do, they aren't repentant of it. In purgatory, they love God and they know that in time they will be joined together with him in that matter. How long does someone suffer in purgatory? Uh, I think one of the children of Fatima had, uh, one of the girls had, uh, Lucia had a, a friend that died, a young girl that died their age, seven, eight years old, whatever it was. And uh, Our Lady told them that she would be in purgatory, as is, without any uh, mitigating service, without anybody gaining indulgence for her or praying for her, as is, as she was, as was scheduled, if you will, she can be there until the end of the world. And she is a seven, eight-year-old, ten-year-old girl. And it was for a venial sin, not a moral sin. Mortal sin, if some dies moral sin, they go to hell. And they will uh, be there for all eternity. Those, so in purgatory, uh, it's just, um, it, it's uh, a lot of cleansing as well. And of course, I, I'm, I'm sure I've mentioned before, but I guess I'll mention again, there's, there's a, presumably a true story of two priests who made an agreement that upon hearing the death of one or the other, that, that the other would go, as soon as possible, go offer mass for the departed, for the soul departed of his friend, the other, his fellow priest. Uh, and of course, in due time, one of the priests died, and fairly shortly, the, the, his fellow priest heard about that, and he hadn't offered mass that day, so he said, well, I can go do it now. So he was walking over the church to offer mass for him, because mass, can draw unlimited amount of graces for the individual in purgatory. And uh, the dead priest appeared to the, his friend the, 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 who was going to go over and offer mass, and he complained to him, almost bitterly, I, I was told the story, that they made an agreement and he didn't keep it. And it took so long to keep the agreement. 
And the other preachers found out about it. And the point being is that purgatory, like hell, even like heaven, they don't measure time as we measure. We measure time by motion. So if we're in a dark room at night with no light, no motion, no, can't see anything, we, we don't know how long time goes. In hell, purgatory becomes one long eternal moment. It's like being at a party that you don't want to be at, being someplace you don't want to be in, just time just drags. In heaven, it seems like a moment, but uh, it went an eternity, and hence with God, it turns to be as a moment. And in purgatory, uh, time uh, likewise lags, but in heaven, once again, it just it flies. So it's years and centuries seem like seconds. So those who are in purgatory, they suffer immensely just in time because they cannot, in pure spirits, they have no motion where they can measure that I've been here one day or two days or three days. This particular case of the priest, he'd been there for a few hours and it felt like years to him. And that poor soul in purgatory at Fatima, the friend of uh, the three children at Fatima, she just died a year or two before. She was, our lady, she's been there for, for until the world comes to an end. I'm sure there was prayers going up, indulgences gained, masses offered, and she probably was released because of the generosity of, the, of her, those who prayed for her. So that's, uh, that's uh, the souls in purgatory. The epistle, and also, uh, and also too, I'd like the altar boys to come back to sacristy briefly today because of what I put, the, the serving schedule on Sunday, the coming Sunday is not what is, uh, is not as it is in the bulletin, so I'd like to just clarify that with them. The epistle appointed for today's Mass is taken for the book, the Apocalypse, chapter 7, verses 2 through 12. In those days, I be... In those days, behold, I, John, saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having a sign of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, till we sign the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them that were signed, and 144,000 were signed, of every tribe of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were 12,000 signed, of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 signed, the tribe of Gad, 12,000 signed. Of the tribe of Aser, 12,000 signed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 signed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 signed. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 signed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 signed. Of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 signed. Of the tribe of Zabalon, 12,000 signed. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 signed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 signed. After this, I saw a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and in sight of the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sitteth upon the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and the ancients and the four living creatures. And they fell down before the throne upon their faces and adored God, saying, Amen, benediction and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving, honor and power and strength to our God forever and ever, amen. The gospel appointed for today's mass, take from the gospel of St. Matthew, chapter five, verses one through 12. At that time, Jesus seeing the multitudes went up into a mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came unto him, and opening his mouth, he taught them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall possess the land. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after justice, for they shall have their fill. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they that suffer persecution for justice sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when they shall revile you and persecute you and speak all that is evil against you untruly for my sake. Be glad and rejoice, for your reward is very great in heaven. Thus far the words of today's holy gospel. Blessed are ye when they shall revile you and persecute you and speak all that is evil against you untruly for my sake. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Uh, last Sunday, I actually I wasn't here last Sunday, I was in Helena. But last Sunday, we talked about the kingship of Christ. The kingship of Christ means that we must recognize Christ as king, that he rules over our hearts, our minds, our souls, 
that we owe him unfailing allegiance and to his church. And that we must not just be hearers of the word, as St. Paul would say, but be doers of the word. I think, or St. James, excuse me. Uh, that we must put into practice that which we know. We can't just know the Catholic faith in an abstract manner. Uh, one could go to a college or a university, go to school, and one could learn, uh, take a study on critical study of religions. You might know, uh, learn to know the beliefs of the Muslim religion, or the know the doctrines of the Mormon religion, understand how the Baptists believe and, and live, and even get to know all the tenets of the Catholic faith and not save your soul. It's not just the academic understanding of what each religion believes. And all religions obviously aren't equal, so it isn't a matter of what religion is out there. It must, we must believe and practice the religion that Christ established. If we were to go back, and look at religions, uh, all religions aren't the same, mind you. Uh, in the Old Testament, you had the religion of the Jews, the, the Hebrews, the Israelites, was founded by God. He told them what he wanted, how he wanted to be worshipped, and they re he required that of them. And then when our Lord came, he did away with the old. The old was in preparation for the new, uh, was in, as they say, in figure. It was there like St. Paul would say, looking through a hidden, uh, looking through a glass in, in an obscure manner. It was there, but not, they didn't fully understand, and then Christ came and made it very explicit. The Old Testament, they sacrificed ox, goats, and lambs, whatever they may have sacrificed. The pagans, the devil worshippers, sacrificed animals and human beings, uh, and all the false worship they gave. But Christ established a clean oblation, and that religion is what we must practice. And so Christ taught the apostles, the apostles through the church, through the popes, down through the centuries, made known to us the various doctrines that we must believe, the, the numerous doctrines we must believe. If we want to bring it down to push comes to shove, far as what we must believe, the, the Apostles' Creed is 12 beliefs, each, it's said that each apostles before they're going to go out and preach the gospel, they were going to, they put together, it said, have a, a summary of what they all believed, and each one proposed one belief that Christ taught them. And then, of course, they expounded upon that. And so we must know the Apostles' Creed, and, and there, there's more as well, of course, all, all that comes with that, that we would draw conclusions from. All that we know, our very source of our faith uh, of our, is uh, Scripture, we find in Scripture and in uh, tradition. And also, I'd like to add to it that we have to use right reasoning and draw conclusions from a number of things, because there are certain things that are not in Scripture, but we can draw conclusions, uh, logical conclusions, that this must apply as well, whether it's the fasting and absence and why and so forth, whatever it may have been. But today's, so that's being Christ as King, we must be his faithful followers. We must believe we must recognize and acknowledge him as king and submit to his kingship, that his rule, his law, his church, because the church is symbolic of heaven itself, and if we wish to go to heaven, we must enter through the doors of the church to enter into heaven, so to speak. But today, in today's gospel, we have there a summary, a summary of what we must put into practice of that which we know about our faith. We know there's three persons, one God. We know who God is. We know the three persons, one God. And the Beatitudes we find in today's gospel is how we put our faith into action. Our Lord said, blessed are they, blessed are they, blessed are they who suffer persecutions, blessed are they who, uh, who whatever, all the various uh, Beatitudes that we must know and put into practice in order to save our soul. That as a Catholic, we're not just hearers of the word, but we're doers of the word. And so certainly we must put into practice uh, the gospel in today's mass. And we look at all the saints. And remind you, the saints that the church puts on the, the calendar that you have in your home um, is just a, a few that were, so to speak, cherry-picked. They're chosen out because of certain traits, certain qualities, certain virtues uh, that makes them stand out as examples 
someone that we can look to and turn to and see how we must conduct ourselves as a housewife, as a husband, as a businessman, as a soldier, as a priest, as a child, a student, in every walk, in every walk of life, every way of life, how we conduct ourselves, we'll find someone as an example that we can live by, whether it's St. Maria Goretti, St. Dominic Savio, St. Saint, Saint Augustine or St. Monica, you name the saint, the church picked those out because there's some specific virtue that stands out that made them the saint. Whether they suffered persecution at the hand of their husband, whether they're beaten by their wife, whether it was alcohol or whatever it may have been, some cross that they had to carry, uh, the church wants us to look at them and see there that we have hope, that we can have, we have hope because this person who is not just an ordinary person, he's probably a great fallen sinner, Saint Maria Magdalena, and she became what they referred to as apostle to the apostles. And the church honors her as that today. Not because of her sin, not because of St. Augustine's sin, but because of the great things they have done. But is that all the saints? By all means, no. We have the butler's lives of the saints. If you have one of the original editions, I have one that's about two and a half inches thick and probably about eight point type on it just lists one saint after another, many of, if not, not most, but many of them are martyrs who died for their faith, who, who not only lived the faith, but stood up on principles willing to die and did die for their faith, dying in horrendous fashions in a manner that no man could even think of. It had to be inspired by the devil himself. And so the church doesn't want to forget them, so we, we know of them as well, that they were recorded in their lives in the martyrology. And there we find another source of lists of saints. But is that all? By no means, by no means. The list of saints is countless. Like, like uh, Abraham was promised by the angel that his seed shall be as numerous as the sands of the sea. His prodigy, his ancestors will be as numerous as the grains in the sand and the sea. And that's the saints. Though uh, as a caveat, as a warning, uh, we know that Many are called, but few are chosen. Another place, our Lord says that uh, with most of them, God is not well pleased. So you have that aspect too, but the saints that we have, we couldn't count them all. We couldn't keep track of them all in themselves. And so we have those. You have your own patron saint. We have the saints that saints are in the gospel. We have the saints that are in the, but, in the, in the lives of saints, butler's lives of saints, one source of saints. Then we have the martyrology that the, that we, the priest use, uh, religious use during the recitation of the office, reminding and, and telling a little bit, just a, a sentence of how this saint or that saint died or lived or the great virtue that stood out, that we might there see to us not just the so-called celebrities of modern days, the, the big names today that are here today and gone tomorrow, but saints that endure not because of who they were, but because of what they've done, how they lived the life of a saint and now are in heaven enjoying the presence of God, will be seeing him for all eternity, seeing him face to face. So we have that to look for. So today the church reminds us of all the saints, maybe even the saints that we rub shoulders with, our parents, our ancestors, who may have been benefactors, people that we've known that we thought they were, uh, you know, like Lazarus, they weren't worthy of our attention. And yet they pick the crumbs off the floor and today they are, as scripture would say, a, a, a Lazarus in the, in the arms of, or the bosom of Abraham. In other words, in heaven. So let's not forget those who have died for tomorrow, especially on Saints Day and throughout the month of November and throughout the year. But also let's just turn to those saints and ask their assistance because they have a love of us, particularly if we have some claim upon their charity, maybe injustice or charity. Uh, turn to them and petition them and ask them for their assistance, their guidance, their enlightenment. And likewise, if you might add to them the, the angels of heaven and your guardian angel, that we would re ask them and, re uh, and ask them to, to keep us in mind, to watch over us, and to assist us that we might save our soul and be with them for all eternity. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.